Good evening. I'm Dr. Masha Mimran. I'm a board member of Temple Emmanuel and a committee member of the Stryker Center. I'm very honored uh, to introduce tonight Monsieur Bernard-Henri Lévy and Janine Di Giovanni. I thank all of you for joining us tonight. Thank you uh, to you who are here in person with us and to those of you who are with us virtually. <laughs> so there are many of you. Bernard-Henri Lévy is one of the world's leading and most influential intellectuals. His incisive mind, intelligence, courage, and sometimes provocative and controversial thinking continue to ask us not to turn away from the urgent questions of today's political and social climate. The universalist instinct that has informed so much of Bernard-Henri Lévy's extraordinary career perhaps springs from his belief that Judaism is a faith of ethics and actions and thus demand that we defend the vulnerable. To call our attention to this plight of millions trapped by violence, government repression and persecution is BHL's life's work. In his new book, The Will to See, he takes his readers where the world has failed the vulnerable. From massacred Christian villages in Nigeria to an overrun refugee camp on the island of Lesbos, from Somalia and Bangladesh and to Ukraine. BHL's new book is a series of reports from the field, yes. But more importantly, it is a manifesto, an ethical plea. The will to see is precisely what its title means, to refuse indifference. He will be joined tonight in conversation with Janine Di Giovanni, a multi-award winning journalist, author, and policy analyst. Janine Di Giovanni has also worked in some of the darkest regions and exposed human rights abuse. She's a life member of the Council on Foreign Relations a senior fellow at Yale Institute for Global Affairs and a non-resident fellow at the New America Foundation. She is the author of thousands of articles and multiple books, including most recently, and I highly encourage you to read it, The Vanishing, Faith, Loss, and the Twilight of Christianity in the Land of the Prophets, published by Public Affairs. If you're joining us virtually, Please send your questions to questions at emmanuelstrikernyc.org. And if you're with us in person, again, thank you for being with us in person, you know what to do. It is such a pleasure to have you both tonight. Please join me, all of you, in welcoming Monsieur Bernard-Henri Lévy and Janine Di Giovanni. Thank you very much. Hello. Thank you so much, everyone, from, for coming out, especially in these difficult times. We're so happy to see you. And we're also so happy that there are so many of you online around the world coming from Australia, Israel, France, all over. So um, welcome. And um, it's really a huge honor for me to be here with my friend, Bernard-Henri Lévy, who is many, many things. Um, he is an emissary to uh, governments. He is a humanitarian. He's a writer. He's a journalist. He's a philosopher. He's a public intellectual. Um, but he's also a, a very good friend and a loyal person to those that, that he cares about. Um, so we're really lucky to have him tonight. And I think we're going to start out He's just published this wonderful book called The Will to See. And really, as I was reading it, what this book is about is an attempt to shake people out of the complacency that we have when we witness terrible things going on around the world. And it's, I, I can't think of a better time for it to come out in the midst of COVID when really 
the news that we've had is really about COVID, about what we're doing in our own countries. But around the world, there are conflicts still raging. There's a new war rising up in Ethiopia and Tigray. In Sudan, there's a coup, a military coup. The war in Syria is still going on. It's 11 years. The Gaza, uh, Palestine, Israel conflict is still going on. So this book really looks at very carefully certain conflicts, Somalia, Libya, um, Kurdistan, which is a big passion of yours. But the first part of it is really wonderful. It's very French, and it's really a kind of deep dive into your intellectual mentors and what brought you to do the kind of work you do. And I think I, my first question is asking you, why do you do this? Because you go. I, I am a war reporter, and I've been doing this for many years. Bernard does not have to do this. He could write these books without going. He could have the same platform, the same fame. But he goes to these places that are very uncomfortable, very dangerous, and, and spends time with people. And I think it was one of your mentors um, who first said to you when you were going to Bangladesh as a very young man, go talk to the real people. Go talk to the real people. So let's start off. Let's go back to you, a young 68er, right? And um, what influenced you to do this? Because you could have had a very comfortable life, but you chose something else. Thank you, Janine, and, and uh, thank you from the bottom of my heart because it is, for me, a true honor to be sitting here with you in this place. As I just told to your son, in this uh, field of working, you are a legend among reporters. I know, no, I'm sorry, among reporters, you are a legend. When I met you first in Bosnia, you were a legend with a few others, uh, Christian Amonpou and so on, but you are not so numerous. So thank you to have accepted to, to be here tonight uh, uh, at my side for the real launching of this, um, uh, of this book. Um, when I remember the young uh, 68 er when I, when I tried to remember the young 68er whom I was, when I went to Bangladesh, this was the question of Janine, what drove me, what pushed me to commit myself to do this uh, work which is not my, my skill, which is not my, my way of earning my life. So why? And why did I go to Bangladesh first time? Two reasons, number one, three reasons, some mentors who taught me that the activity of war reporter is one of the highest and the most noble in the world. This was the conviction of uh, Ernest Hemingway, of André Malraux, and of Curcio Malaparte. They were writers. And they considered that the writing by excellence was reporting, and especially war reporting, number one. Number two, uh, I was, as many young men, and I hope as many people who are not so young, for me, the idea and the images of injustice, of suffering, of massacre and of genocide was unsufferable, unbearable. And I, I have very soon understood that the West has never been at the rendezvous of genocides. We turned a blind eye with the Westerners when uh, happened the Armenian genocide, we turned a black eye, a blind eye, when happened the Holocaust. 
Same with uh, Rwanda. I was not so young, but same with Darfur, same with Cambodia when I was 25. There is a rule in the Western world for reasons which we could dig, which is that in front of massacre on large scale, we are mesmerized and we don't intervene. And this idea for me is absolutely uh, intolerable. So very soon when I understood through the voice of another of my mentors, André Malraux, that there was a genocide going on in Bangladesh, I said to myself, and he, he launched an appeal for an international brigade, like he did in Spain 40 years, be, 40 years before, like my father did when he was a teenager. I decided to enlist, to be there, to bear witness, to help, to show and to, and to act in, uh, with solidarity. This is the second reason. And the third reason is a philosophical one, but it would be complicated to enter into the details. But when I was very young, there was a, a school of philosophy which was reigning in Europe, which, has, which was sovereign in Europe, which was the school of Edmund Husserl. And Edmund Husserl was a German philosopher of the first part of the 20th century who had a work divided into, in really two fields. On one side, the most abstract philosophy, nearly algebraic, uh, nearly uh, uh, um, deprived of any flesh, and on the other side, what he called phenomenology, and he was the inventor of phenomenology, which was the opposite, which was the contact with the things, which was the confrontation with one of his disciples, Jean-Paul Sartre, called the great anger of the things, as if the things themselves had feeling and could be angry. So me, when I was 20 years old, I was a spiritual son of Edmund Husserl. Part of my brain was on the side of uh, Jacques Lacan, Louis Althusser, Michel Foucault, the most idealistic philosophers, and the other part was on this side of phenomenology and um, concrete contact with the very flesh of the very things. So this combination made that till now, when something happens at the end of the world, when I have the feeling that we are not numerous enough to care, when I feel that my voice can be useful, when I think that I can have some accesses whom, which everybody does not have, I go. So you believe, as I believe, in humanitarian intervention. And you and I were there when Srebrenica, Bosnia, the Bosnian genocide where 8,000 men and boys were slaughtered under the eyes of the United Nations. Um, a year earlier, the Rwandan genocide, a million people were slaughtered. Yet there are people who call humanitarian intervention a, a Western plot, a way of trying to overthrow governments. Um, during the war in Syria, for instance, there were a lot of calls, myself amongst them, for humanitarian intervention that would end the siege of Aleppo, the terrible carnage in Homs. And yet there was another, there's an always other voices that say, this is the Western countries, France, the UK, the US, trying to intervene in places where they don't belong. What defense do you have for that towards humanitarian intervention? Your book, talks a lot about internationalism rather than globalism. Could you explain that and, and try to you know, give reason why we need, if we are powerful nations and we have the ability to protect civilians? The big misunderstanding, but it proceeds from really bad faith. They know that, but they do as if they did not know it. That 
Those who think as we do, you and me, never pretended to inject democracy in countries who don't wish it. We never pretended, you did not, I did not, I don't plead for that, export democracy as a sort of um, foreign body in another, in a, in a corpse. Colonialism or imperialism. Ab absolutely. The, my plea for uh, in internationalism and for humanitarian or political interventionism proceeds from two facts, two ideas. Number one, democracy is not a Western idea. It is a universal idea. And you have to be a big racist in order to believe that democracy is automatically on the side of the former colonial countries. Democracy is a value which is worldwide. Number two, when we, at least for myself, and I know you, you feel the same, when I agree or when I ask an international humanitarian or political intervention, it is because I know that on the ground, in the place where you are going to intervene, you have some people who believe in democracy, who embrace the values of liberalism, who wish for, who need solidarity, who need help. The idea has never been to, to apply a foreign or uh, external model. It is to help, to encourage, to show to some people who live in a, in a desperate loneliness that they are not completely lonely. So those who treat interventionism as a colonialism, they just work the same way as the extreme rightists who say everyone at home and the ships will be well guarded. It is the same on the right wing. You have people who, who think we don't care about what can, happen in, uh, what can happen in Rwanda. We don't care about these tri tribal conflicts in Balkans. It's not. These parts of the world are neglectable. If they even disappear from the surface of the earth, it will not make a real difference. This is the right wing. The, the left wing, they say what you said, that we are imposing some, some uh, uh, Western values. The result? is the same. They think the same way. And those of the left who condemn as neo-imperialist, as an insult to identity politics interventionism, they act as those who they think to be their worst enemies. They, they think as extreme right wing or, or, or fascists. It's interesting because it is the extreme left that attack those who believe in, in humanitarian intervention. Um, I want to talk about various conflicts and the ones, especially the ones you write about in the book. But let's go back to Bosnia um, because that's where we met. And for me, anyway, the war in Bosnia had a, a massive impact, not just on my work, but on my life. It really affected me. And I know it did you as well. What was it about that war that drew us in so deeply? Was it that it was a European war? Was it that it could have been prevented? What was it that made Bosnia such a painful, painful lesson for all of us? Number one, it was in Europe. We really thought, my generation and yours after me, we really thought that war was a past nightmare and that it will never come back again after Nazism, after Second World War. The whole European order had been built on this idea and suddenly we saw the war back. So it was a shock, first. Second, uh, this cruelty and indifference of the West who, for the women and men of goodwill, was uh, absolutely uh, a scandal. I remember so well John Major, 
François Mitterrand, euh, euh, George Bush, building huge theories, pretending that to stop this bloodbath, we would need some hundreds of thousands of troops on the, on the ground, and so on. And it is true that we were, we were a bunch of people, because we were on the ground, knowing that it was untrue that the Serbian uh, militias who did shot the children in the city of Sarajevo were bad soldiers, that they were amateurs, that a very um, light intervention would be enough. So when you know that, when you know that uh, your president uh, does as if uh, it should, uh, 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 a new world, world war was requested. When you know that it is, it, it is enough of very little intervention to stop a massacre, you become mad, which we were. And number three, in my case, it was the beginning of the, of the time in Europe where we pretended to, to wait for, to demand, to to ask for a moderate Islam. It was the beginning of the, radical, of the rise of the radical Islam, the beginning of the terrorism, Algeria, beheading of civilians, and so on. And we said in France, in England, and elsewhere, we are against terrorism, but we are not against Islam. Everybody said that and we wait for, we wish for a real democratic Islam. And we knew that this democratic Islam existed, that it was incarnated, that it was in power, that it was shaping a whole civil society, and that this was Bosnia. And in front of this moderate Islam which existed, what did we do? We the West pretending to, to love him, to love it, to, to be ready to embrace it, to wait for that Godot. <laughs> we did not support when it was bombed and, and, uh, and destroyed by uh, stupid um, uh, barbaric mi militias. So there was such an inconsistency in this behavior of our leaderships that again, I think, that we were uh, few humanitarian journalists, simple citizens, who felt a real indignation in front not only of massacres, but also in front of this level of hypocrisy. And uh, the fight against hypocrisy, hypocrisy has always been a good fuel for indignation. And of course, the terrible legacy of Bosnia, 30 years, it will be 30 years in April since the war started, and we're now getting terrible news that um, there is, there could possibly be an impending conflict rising up again, because the war did not end well. The Dayton Peace Accords, which ended the war, were insufficient to really deliver justice to many of the victims who suffered horribly during that war. But moving on to other conflicts that you, you write about and, and you've worked in, you have a very enviable role because you're a writer, you're a political philosopher, but you're also able to have the ear of presidents. And I know you don't like that, that a French journalist said he's the man who has the ear of the president, but you do have the ability. For instance, in the war in Bosnia, you somehow got Alia Izabegovic, the president of the Bosnian um, Republic, you got him out of besieged Sarajevo, brought him to Paris, and brought him to the Elysee pa Palace to try to give him a voice. You did the same thing with Libya. You, you went to Libya, which was incredibly dangerous at the time. You, you actually, you got in from Egypt on the back of a vegetable truck, I think, because there were no taxis, so you hitchhiked and got in the back of a, a vegetable van that was going from Egypt to Libya. Um, you saw what was happening. You then went back to Paris, got a meeting with Sarkozy, and managed somehow to convince him that the right thing to do was to intervene. How do you do this? 
How do I do it? It depends uh, on the circumstances. Let's talk about, let's stick to Libya and then we'll go on to the other ones. But yeah, tell, but tell, unravel Libya, Lib Libya, what happened there? Libya, uh, it, it was uh, it was ra rather simple. I was uh, caught in a little in a real spiral of uh, of sorrow, of uh, indignation, and of will to repair. We are here in a uh, Jewish uh, place, and uh, I was animated by the will. To Tikkun Olam, will to repair. This is the, at the core of myself. Uh, since the time I, I turned my back to the idea of revolution, I embraced the idea that uh, the, the will which has still to be, to, be, to be pursued is the will to repair the world. So I believe that. Uh, and, and when I have an opportunity to do it, I do it. When I have an access to a president, I use it. When I have an access to, to a few days ago, I was in the, in the Congress of the United, uh, of, the, of America on, on the Capitol Hill uh, with a group of uh, congressmen to plead and to try to, to move them about the fate of the Christians of Nigeria. So I would have done anything to be able to address real lawmakers in order to tell them what is happening in, in, uh, in Nigeria. So for me, it's a must, it's a reflex, and um, when I have the possibility uh, of doing that, I do it. And I, sometimes I have the possibility because I, uh, I wrote other books, I have some a little credit as a philosopher, a little credit as a writer, so I'm ready to use this credit to take some moral risks, which are sometimes more, um, which have a higher cost than the physical risk. I'm ready to do that. The credit I get from my, my, my books, I'm uh, ready to use it for, for the causes which I have at heart, also the cause of the Jews, the cause of Israel, uh, it goes without saying, number one. And number two, it is a philosophical um, uh, point. Uh, my book is called The Will to See, but it could have been called The Will to Do and The Will to Act. I told you at the beginning of our conversation that uh, uh, nobody seemed more uh, respectable for me than a war reporter, some, someone who takes risk in order to go and see and bring back. I should have added that there is another category of people whom I respect, who are the women and the men of action. So those who see, those who act, uh, on one side, uh, on the other side, Lord Byron, let's say, who decides to go uh, in Greece uh, uh, fighting for its independence against Ottomans, uh, who decides to go and, and fight and, uh, and make some politics in Greece, this is also something which I revere. So for me, when I have the opportunity to do both, to report and to influence, I think that I made my, my, uh, my, my duty. And I know, uh, 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 this is important to precise, I, I, I know that um, it, is not, it does not match exactly with what journalism should be. Journalism is objectivity. I know that, and I respect that. I respect and, I, and I, 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 I revere again the fact that in a society you have some people, some reporters, who just report the facts, who just um, uh, do their best to eradicate any ideology, any party pre from their writing. I know that this exists. I know that it is crucial for a democracy. And I have the highest consideration for those who practice this. But it's not my way. I know that it is great, 
I do my job in another way. I try to be objective, of course. I try to be the closest as possible to the truth. But the idea of a journalist who tries not to intervene in the very field of observation where he's operating is not my idea. It's not well or not well. Maybe it's not, it's not well, by the way. Maybe I'm wrong, but it's my way. The, I, I, I break the rule uh, saying that uh, a journalist should be like a scientist in the laboratory who had to do his best efforts not to have his hand or his mind interfering with the, his observation. So it's a, it's a philosophical point. And, and I am on the side of those who believe that when you can see and act, get a good article and make a great deed, is for me the best formula for myself. I mean, the book really should be called The Will to Act, because in many ways it's, it's a call to action. It's a call to not look away, to telling people that these things are happening and we must know that they are there. Um, I'm, I, you wrote so beautifully in your chapter about Lesbos and the, the refugee crisis in Europe. What do you feel now, what is the state of Europe right now with Brexit, with the rise of more right-wing governments, Orban in Hungary, Poland, um, France, I mean, Le Pen and, and various other parties. The German elections just happened. There was no mention of the outside world. It was basically very insular. And of course, we've lost a great leader in Angela Merkel, who was the moral conscience of U Europe during the refugee crisis. So what, what do you see for, for France, um, for Europe in, in the coming years? And given the refugee crisis, the people that are Afghanistan now, you know, there will be a whole new group of people who will be trying to get into, into the European countries. For me, the most sad part of, uh, of this book is probably the chapter about Lesbos. And uh, the, my trip, my two trips to Lesbos, I went twice in order to write this story. I did two stays in Lesbos, where the stays, the, the trips, from which it was the hardest for me to recover. As you know, better than me, you are a far better reporter than me. When you do a difficult report, reportage, it's very hard to come back to normal life, to civil life, to petty preoccupation. And, and you don't dare to say it also. You know, it's a I, I know this sentiment. When I come back from Libya, when I come back from Mogadishu, it always takes me a few days to, to, to come back to, to the surface, to, to the free air. Lesbos, it was the worst. This slow... Um, slow motion horror at the gates of, at the door, at the, at the step door of Europe, in the fatherland of uh, Homer and of uh, Dante and of Victor Hugo and of Lord Byron, uh, the situation of 20,000 women, children and men which the 27 countries, members of Europe, were not able to adopt and to accept was the very image of nightmare. Lesbos was hell, and the situation of people of Lesbos was, for me, nightmare. And when I think of that, uh, <laughs> when, when I think of this chapter of the book, uh, I feel it as a real failure. Um, Syria, uh, I went in, uh, in Syria and Kurdistan. I uh, organized um, um, a contact uh, which is uh, 
uh, presented in a book between my, the French president and the general Maslum Kobane. Uh, when I was in, uh, in Ukraine, uh, I spent some time. Also, I, I think that my, my dream to, to see and to act worked in a way or in another. In Lesbos, I failed because I came back with a very simple plan of uh, 18,000 people divided into 27, which meant for some countries, for Slovenia, maybe 20 refugees, for France, maybe a few hundred. I addressed my plan to our leaders, starting with mine, with President Macron. And I encountered a, a deaf and, uh, and blind uh, system of power. And this really depressed me, depressed me a lot. So, regarding your question, I see the future of Europe on these grounds um, in a very dark way. And Europe is based on the very idea of hospitality. Uh, Europe is the name of a little uh, Lebanese princess, princess from Lebanon, hosted by a territory who was going to be named after her. So Europe means that. Europe means uh, uh, travel, journey, uh, people from, from far coming on this ground. Uh, the, the route, the journey of the refugees, those whom I saw in Lesbos, sometimes was the very journey, the same itinerary of the princess Europe of the Greek mythology. We forget that. We turn our back to that, which means that we forget the very idea of, and we sacrifice the very idea of Europe. So for this reason, on this topic, for the moment, game is not over as our lives, but I am pessimistic. I want to talk to you about Kurdistan, but first I want to ask you a question which I struggle with a lot. Um, and I want you to use your, your philosopher's hat. <laughs> We've really, the world has suffered. Millions and millions of people have died from COVID. We've had nearly two years of people being in lockdown, of people being isolated, of people becoming extremely lonely and inward. How do you think we will recover as a planet, as a people? How will we recover from this trauma that really, you know, you and I have witnessed trauma in various countries, Darfur or Rwanda or Bosnia, but this is a, this is a collective trauma that the world has suffered. As a philosopher, drawing on all the people that you, you quote and, and talk about, so many great writers in your book, which is wonderful, how do we recover from this? First of all, as always, the, the deads will not recover. <laughs> they are dead. And um, their families will not recover. The sorrow will not disappear. Uh, after that, this being said, um, again, how to repair? How to repair? Two ways vaccines and reports and reportage. Vaccines, science, uh, uh, better medicine, better shared, not reserved only to the West, uh, with the real access to the poorest parts of the world. I'm a very strong militant of that. And um, if I could use this, uh, my book, and when it will be released, the film which was drawn out of the book in order to convince a big laboratory or to, to, to spread vaccines very quickly, I would have done again my, my, my duty. So number one, vaccines. Number two, reportage. Because one of the collateral damage, not collateral, the other damage, of the COVID crisis was to close our eyes, to close our hearts, and to close our doors, our houses, 
from the others. And there was a sort of um, um, a tendency um, to, 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 to self-retreat, uh, a renewal of egoism, a progress of cyni cynicism, which was another consequence of COVID. As you well said at the beginning of our chat, when you looked at the news two, two years ago, one year ago, uh, the world had disappeared from the news. The world had disappeared from the screens. And the world tended to disappear from our brains. And this is, by the way, one of the reasons why I did that, this book. When I, when I understood that we were living in a parallel universe where it was as if uh, there was no longer war in Syria, as if the Christian of Middle East, yours, Christian, if I dare say, were uh, <laughs> in, the, in glory, uh, no problem. Uh, where it was as if Putin had become a gentle guy, having taken his uh, uh, retreat, uh, retirement, as if Putin had not again retired. We were living in this parallel universe. When I felt that, I went to the f four or five uh, editors whom I knew in France and in America, Paris Match, Republica, Wall Street Journal, I told them, please, the art of reporting is in decay, the concern for the rest of the world is reduced to nearly zero, the space in your magazines is known for reportage, so I am your guy. I have some time, I have some passions, I have some accesses, I, this is yours if you wish. And, I, and uh, this was the source of the book. And I say that one of the reply to, the, to COVID has to be a reply to this growing indifference and egoism. We have to open our eyes again, our hearts again, and our doors again to the rest of the world. So we have a group of us you and, and others, we have to be as soon as possible on the road again. But you were on the road during COVID. <laughs> Part of the book, and I urge all of you to, to read it because it's a really wonderful, profoundly moving and important book. But what is staggering is I think even before you were vaccinated, you went, you went to Bangladesh you went back to Bangladesh where you hadn't been since you were a young man living there for months and months during the, in the aftermath of the war. You went to Lesbos and you went to Mogadishu. So Mogadishu, for those of you who don't know, um, the capital of Somalia, is one of the scariest places I've ever been. And you call it quite rightly the Grozny of Africa. Grozny, the capital of Chechnya, which, which fell uh, to Russian forces in 2000, but let's, you know, you're traveling in that time. Can we just like, what was it like? Were you frightened of getting sick? What, what compelled you to leave your safe home in Paris and go in the middle of COVID to these places? In the, uh, first of all, um, when uh, the law is that, when there is a place of disaster, when there is a place where humanity is bleeding and when the access is very difficult and when I have access, I think that my duty is to, is to go. I have a nice life. I, um, I am privileged. I have a charming wife. I have some great children. Uh, I, I have all the looks in life, luck, I'm lucky. So from time to time, when the situation is the one I say, you have to pay the tax to destiny. You know, tax, it's like an impôt. It's an obligation for an you, obligation. a moral yeah, obligation? Yeah. Obli if I can, yes, of course, if, if I could not, no. But it happens that I could go to Mogadishu. 
that uh, very few journalists, uh, I know you one, but we have very few since 20 years. I could do it. Uh, Mogadishu was really disappearing from the map of the world. It had become a sort of black hole of distress and misery. Uh, I had this contract with this bunch of newspapers, this group of newspapers. Possibility appeared, I, I, I took it. And this is a general principle. When you can do something, when you are few to be able to do it, you have to do it. When few people can. When you can, if you don't, <laughs> you are a bastard, really. That's what I feel. I, at least I would, it would be difficult for me to look at myself in a mirror if I didn't do it. All the more during COVID time, because what I said. Because really, COVID was a tragedy, and I took great care of my, my, my relatives, my family, my friends. I was uh, uh, very anxious about my, my elders, and so on, and so on. But we were not obliged. The tragedy did not compel us to throw into nothingness, into nothingness, uh, uh, two-thirds of humanity. So all the more during the time of COVID, there was a duty of involvement, of commitment, a duty to go in the most remote places and see and bring testimony. Yeah, my, my mentor was an Israeli lawyer called Felicia Langer, and she told me when I was a very young woman, and it changed my life forever, if you have the ability to go to these places and bear witness, then you have an obligation. It's, it's just exactly. you don't have a choice. Um, there are so many questions people want to ask you. So I still haven't gotten to Kurdistan and other places in the book. So I, again, I urge you to read it. But let's start with this first question, which is a big one. Do you see peace in the Middle East? <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe, yes. For the first time in my life, I, I, I believe that it is possible because of the Abraham Accords, because of the Abraham Agreements. This, for me, is a turning point. The fact that a group of Arab countries uh, decided to, to deal with Israel to consider Israelis as uh, normal humans and to deal with them is the real turning point. Yeah. And history, history with, the, history with the big H is a strange uh, affair. Sometimes you try to push the door, one door, and you push again, and you push again, and it resists, and you cannot open it. And uh, Another door opens in a completely unexpected way. For, as for myself, I spent my life during 50 years, I am an advocate and a believer of the two-state solution. I believe that the, the, the door to peace is the two-state solution. I believe that since uh, my first travel in Israel in 1967, I was one of the, the, the godfathers of the Geneva Plan, Le Plan de Genève, with Yossi Bellin and uh, 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 Abdel Rabot. I, was a, I really believed that the, if the miracle of the peace appeared, it will appear through as a ray of light through the door of this two-state solution. I did not expect that it could come from the door of Abu Dhabi, Morocco, uh, Bahrain, uh, Egypt, of course, but since long, Jordania, uh, signing a, a peace treaty. But it, it's a case. So uh, this nourishes, nurtures my, my, my hope. And if the, if the ray comes from the door, it will come from everywhere. If really the Abraham Accords work, you will see. The Palestinian 
uh, problem will be solved also. Um, the worst despotic countries of the area will be weakened and um, it will be a whole, a whole process. Um, history works like this in a, by ex unexpected ways. That's a very optimistic view, and I, my only pushback on that would be that the Abraham Accords were negotiated without the Palestinians involved, which was a great betrayal to them. And okay. I just got back from Gaza, and the you know we I don't want to go down that road, but the suffering there is immense, as you know. Um, so that is an issue that will have to be dealt with. So the next question is another big one. Why do you think the world sits by and watches the atrocities against humanity? Because the, because the world does not know that it is the world. Because you have, uh, you have always had, this is a theological debate dating from millenaries. Those who believe that there is one humanity and those who believe that there is diverse humanities. In theology, it is the, the, the quarrel between the monogenism and the polygenism. You had these debates when um, uh, the conquistadores went to, to, to America when they, when they met, uh, when they... <laughs> discovered and when they were confronted to Indians, there was among the Christian churches, those who believed that all creatures uh, peopling the earth were the descendants of one man, and those who believed, no, that there was a, a plurigenetic history of humanity. So you have, alas, a lot of people who believe that there is different human species, that you have, that you have different worlds, that uh, uh, the world is not, uh, is not one, is not even dual as the Gnostics believe, but is plural. I believe it is unique. I believe, as I say in a, in a scene of the movie, which I hope you will see, soon, I don't know where, but this, I hope, is in negotiation. I happened to be a few months ago in a, in a place where um, children, uh, teenagers, whose parents have been uh, in, uh, with Daesh, were detained. Islamic State. Die. Islamic State. And there was in, in the surrounding of Kamishli, the capital of Syria and Kurdistan, a sort of jail with teenagers or children from 8 to 15 uh, who are detained, though having committed no crime. They were just, uh, they are just uh, guilty of, uh, considered guilty of the crimes of their parents, which is not very acceptable for me not to say more. And the, there is a moment, I had a, I had a long conversation with them, and you, you will see, uh, or those who saw maybe online the film, there is a moment where I, where I tell them that. I tell them who I am. Some are French, they knew vaguely. I tell my name. I say that my name is Levi, that I am a Jew, that I'm a proud Jew, but that for me, Jew, Christian, Muslim is the same. And I saw among them, there was the huge majority of them agreed, but I saw in some, in a few, those who were already intoxicated by probably the bad ideas of their parents and uh, of their, uh, those who were um, implicated in ISIS and so on and so on. So this is the main point, to, to, to battle in favor of monogenism in theology is unity of humanity in, uh, in politics and uh, to believe that the world is one. And w we are fewer and fewer to believe that, fewer and fewer. 
and uh, we are fewer and fewer to believe in universal values. What is the problem with the ultra-right and ultra-left who were speaking at the beginning? They really believe, both of them, that we have some big civilizations which are like blocks uh, frozen in themselves, close to each other, without any possible communication. This is the, the root of the suprematism of the extreme right and of the relativism of the partisans in some of uh, European and American campuses of the woke theory. They believe that, for example, human rights belong to the Western thought, that they are engaged human rights in, uh, in the Western uh, thought, that they cannot be conceived out of the thought of John Locke, of uh, John Stuart Mill, and that the idea that an idea that a principle can migrate, can combine itself with other philosophies because humanity is one, is unconceivable for them. So this is a real fight. The fight in favor of the idea that, of course, there are some civilizations, there are some different cultures, each of them has its nobility, its charm, its merits, its virtues, but they, there are bridges, and not only bridges, there are some parts of one which can be endorsed by another. That, uh, uh, again, they are not like in the philosophy of Leibniz, monades, uh, completely uh, uh, um, um, uh, enclosed in themselves. This is a big philosophical fight which has to be waged. Yeah, there's this ultra-left view that human rights is a, is a Western plot because we're imposing our Western ideals onto countries and violating their sovereignty. I've just been given a signal that I have to move on to the questions. Do we have time for a few more questions? One, okay. So earlier I asked you if you could talk about the process of writing because you are so prolific. You've written 35 books as well as all of your traveling, all of your other work. So someone's question is, as an intellectual and reporter of the world, you have a different perspective than most people. How do you get into the right mindset to start writing your books? How do you engage the masses into these very complicated ideas? I try my best, uh, sometimes I, I fail, sometimes I fail a little less. For example, I try to do films. This is a way to address to, to more people. This book has uh, um, given place to, to <coughs> a documentary which has been seen in my home country by uh, hundreds of thousands, maybe one million and a half people, I think, really seen. So uh, this, I was happy for, uh, for that. It will be, the film has been uh, uh, screened, as I told you, in some places in Washington. I was in Los Angeles yesterday. There will be a screening in New York in a, in, in a few days, a private screening. I hope it will go on TV. I hope it will go on the platform. If I do that, it, I, will, I will have ma made it. I will, have trans I will have transformed the book of a philosopher, which I am, into um, uh, an object uh, accessible for, for, for many. So th this is one way. Another way of reaching, um, of, of going beyond the elite is to try to write in an accessible way. I write the will to see, I pretend, I hope and I, fe I, I, I feel, I, I believe that it is a serious book with some philosophical references, but anybody can enter in it, I'm sure. The, the depiction I do about the martyrdom of this 
Christian Nigerian lady uh, butchered uh, at the beginning of the book. Anybody who has a heart uh, will enter in this story and will um, will uh, will embrace the destiny of this of this uh, of this lady. Uh, when I speak, uh, when I meet the young Ahmad Masoud in Afghanistan a few months before the takeover of the Taliban, when he announced me uh, precisely what will happen if America persists, continues in the Donald Trump plan under uh, Joe Biden hat and cap, when Masoud tells me that, when he describes uh, the the collapse, inevitable collapse of the Afghan army, when he shows me his uh, personal bravery, when he expresses, when I see him in Panjshir and when I see him among his commanders and the commanders of his father making one handful of brave and valiant uh, uh, defenders of their civilization and ours, this chapter of the book, honestly, I don't believe, I'm sure that you don't need to have read Schopenhauer or, or Hegel to enter in it. You will be, I hope, you will feel brotherly with this great young man, sweet and brave with the young Masoud. So I try to achieve that. It takes me time, it takes me work, it takes much more time to write simply than in an obscure way, but as always, I take the time. Do we have time for, no. I just want to conclude with one thing. How do you want to be remembered? What is your, how do you want to be remembered? What will your legacy be? <laughs> it's something we all should think about, actually. Too early to, too early to say. <laughs> thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Thank you, my dear Janine. Thank you, Bernard. And I recommend, if I may, your last book about the Syria and the threat on the Christians on what on what on what remains of the Christian in the Middle East is a must read, an absolute must read. Thank you so much.